This is Jesse Hensley. This is Josh Turner. And this is Chris Bow. Welcome to Turn Down for What. Welcome back. Turn Down for What. Another well, week of awesome. Another week of awesome. I got to come up with a better intro. Line. I feel like always I'm like another week, another episode. It's like, that's true. That's where we're at right, to, right now today. <laughs> Lord. Okay. Well, today um, we are going to be further conversing uh with our fellow ev community and we have the wonderful privilege of having will on the phone with us uh welcome to the podcast thank you for having me look forward to talking with y'all absolutely well um obviously you drive multiple different evs why don't you tell us about what you have and kind of what your experience has been like amongst those different vehicles Sure. So I've got, uh, well, overall, I've had EVs for eight years, but we'll, we'll just talk about what I have currently. So I have a 2018 Tesla Model 3 Performance, a 2020 Taycan Turbo, a 2022 Lightning Short uh, Standard Range, and a 2024 Tesla Cybertruck. That's one heck of a garage, man. That it's is a good a garage. garage. And, and, Tell for the folks that, that don't know you, I mean, talk about your your different social media uh, handles out there and then uh, kind of what you've been using these for, because it's not as it's not only just that you drive them uh, for the fun of driving them, which it is fun. Uh, but just talk about the community you've built down there in, in Southern California. Sure. So um, we yeah, we're all in on EV. So uh, ever since 2015, I got my first Tesla kind of uh really jumped in that EV space and the EV advocacy space. In 2018, we started a club called Tesla Club SoCal. Um, it's basically a non-sanctioned owner's club. It was it had nothing to do with Tesla. It was all about us. And uh, we, my wife and I, um, just kind of grew the club from zero to over 2,000 members. Uh, we started noticing that there are going to be obviously other EV brands out there, EV brand owners. And we started noticing some of those EV brand owners wanting to go to our events and stuff. So we started a secondary club called SoCal EVs, which is basically open to any brand of EVs. Uh, we also do something called zero emission runs, which are basically uh, all electric car drives. And we do some, you know, drives from 20 miles all the way out to Vegas and up to Northern California and back. So we have really, really cool events that way. Um, my handles on social media are F the pump. So basically I started something back in 2018 saying, Hey, we really need to start engaging people. And what's the best way to engage people by being a little disruptive, a little in your face and just call it what it is F the pump. Um, and it's really been a great uh, handle to engage those comments from both sides. So it's really kind of a polarizing um, uh, logo, polarizing phrase. And it's been a lot of fun uh, really growing this EV advocacy from, from zero to what it is now. So like I said, within the SoCal EVs group, we have over 200 members, and that's growing every day. Awesome. And yeah, I had, uh, I've, I've, you know, obviously through uh, Chris gotten connected to you through the different social platforms, and uh, I saw what you had done to your uh, cyber truck, and it is beautiful. It's stunning. Okay. Yeah, we just had it wrapped, so um, I'm not sure if you guys have a picture on it, but it's basically a red fading to a flat black in the back, so it's a kind of a, an ombre kind of look, and it's been getting a lot of attention and a lot of thumbs yeah, up. Before we jumped on, you were talking about the uh, driving the vehicle to get attention. You're already driving a Cybertruck, but then you do something cool like that to the Cybertruck, and then you're going to get all of the extra views. And in SoCal, I mean, in my my guess would be that it's, You've probably potentially seen even another cyber truck, maybe up to up to date, or have you seen other ones driving around? Yeah, so I'm actually starting to see more and more every day. So uh, in my drive yesterday, I saw five different cyber trucks. Um, wow! I saw a matte wrapped, a matte black wrapped cyber truck, a matte gray wrapped cyber truck, and then three stainless steel trucks. So they're 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 starting to become a little more a little more uh, prevalent down here in Southern California. And over in Tennessee, I've yet to see one at all, period, not in the showroom, nowhere. I mean, there's none anywhere nearby me because California got, and Texas got the first shipments. Um, but, you know, they're not – we've not had the luxury of seeing one. I think uh, – uh, Chris, have, have, you seen, have, have you seen one in the wild or did you just see the one in the showroom? You went for so the I've, delivery I've, event. So I, I went and joined Will for his delivery event. Yeah. And I, I'd seen it before in the showroom um, and occasionally driving by but never been up close – uh, in a meaningful way where I could even get inside. And so Will was was amazing. 
went down and got to do the delivery with Will. Uh, got to get in and have a ride in it and check it out and give it a good once over. One of about what ten people will that were looking yeah. at every nook and cranny on that truck. Yeah, I brought yeah. my own pit crew to make sure we uh, go through it with the fine tooth comb. It was it was pretty good. Yeah, that was that was an absolute blast. And then uh, I know afterwards uh, there was an event you guys did and had multiple cyber trucks uh up there was that santa clarita you guys did that will uh yeah we we kind of uh tagged along with the santa clarita tesla owners club and they uh had put an event together where there were nine cyber trucks at this event yeah which is amazing i just did one this weekend with uh tesla owners club san joaquin valley who had their anniversary and um tesla owners club east bay wilmer came out with his cyber truck um, and it was actually just coincidentally, it was the day that John from Tesla Owners Club Silicon Valley, uh, which is probably the biggest, you know, group uh, of owners down there. He just took delivery of his Cybertruck that day. So he showed up as well and then uh, turned around. And the next thing you know, there's five Cybertrucks there. There was like a desert wrap, not desert camo, but just kind of desert color. There was um, like that that flat matte black that was wrapped. There were three stainless there. Um, and then, uh, they were, again, just the community has been all really great. They, they brought my lightning in inside of ceramic garage where this was being held. And I, had my lightning right there amongst the, the, the cyber trucks and, uh, this amazing custom model three that I, I'm sure you've seen before, uh, that's, that's done up with, um, just the, the, what the frunk, uh, same kind of thing I have, but for the Tesla. And so shout out Tony Fom once again for, for his amazing work. And so, yeah, they're becoming really, really common out in California. I mean, I, I've seen quite a few of them out here now. And I don't know if they're the same owners. It's hard to tell because because they're not custom wrapped the way Will does his. Um, when they're just stainless, it's it's hard to be uh, sure. Is that the same yeah. Cybertruck? Am I seeing a bunch more of these? Um, my son got to take his first ride in the Cybertruck. And it was Wilmer uh, gave my son and I a ride. And that was a whole lot of fun. Um, but I think that is the cool thing about it is that it, it stands on its own as this amazing magnet. Uh, and then, you know, will you always differentiate yours? I mean, go back through what you've done historically, cause you don't just leave them stock. You've, I think all of yours have, have been done to some degree, right? Yeah. Well, the Southern California car culture is, is really big into modifications. So, um, you know, and when, when Tesla is basically, they all look exactly the same, except there's a different paint color on them. So, uh, like our Model 3 right now, um, you know, it's got all kinds of um, iterations of, of modification and other between carbon fiber, this and that. Uh, it has had bags before. It's now it's now turned into a race car. So we kind of stripped out the entire suspension and braking system, made it a race car. Uh, but yeah, they they all have all of our vehicles have wraps on them. So some mute, muted wraps, some crazy, crazy wraps. Um, uh, it's it's kind of fun to to try to outdo the other person when you go to these different events because again we do it two to three events a month so you kind of get the same group um with the, you know with some extra people so within that same group you always kind of want to outdo the other person that's kind of what the california car culture is all about <laughs> it's like the jeep owners while they're ducks you know you have the uh the ev culture with all your different wraps uh but yeah well i mean that's that's super cool um, obviously with driving a diverse portfolio of EVs, uh, there's probably a difference in experience between the Tesla experience. You know, we've had the discussion in charging infrastructure, but Taycan has one of the highest rated charging curves out there in the market. And what's your experience been like driving kind of your different portfolio of vehicles? Yeah. So, I mean, I was Tesla all the way up to a couple of years ago and I really never, never experienced the, the outside third party experience. So I was always great about charging. And then when we got the, the Porsche, I was like, Ooh, this is a much different experience going to an yeah. electrify America station than that. So it wasn't that it, it was, it was, you know, it was mediocre at best, but um, we've taken the, uh, on one of our zero runs to Las Vegas, I drove my lightning, my wife drove the, the Porsche Taycan and we'd go to the same station and she would be done, you know, 20 minutes faster than my lightning was. So that Porsche Taycan really does charge, charge well. Um, the lightning charge is great. It just doesn't charge as fast as the Taycan. Yeah. So this is the um, one yeah, big beef the, I have compared to all the competition is the lightning charge curve maxes out like 175, 180. Uh, but I mean, Taycan is supposed to be rated for like 330 or 340 at a max charge speed, which is just insane. If the charger can actually deliver that, I mean, it's all up to the charging capabilities, but 
the Chargers that are actually capable of delivering that. I'm, Ty can't supposed to be one of the best in the market as far as uh, delivered charging speeds. Yeah, and, and it does. Like I said, it, it, it was, it's a good 20 minutes ready before the other cards are ready. So um, I really enjoy that car. Basically, the, you know, between my wife and I, what car we're going to drive that day, um, really the, the three, again, is now a dedicated race car. So it's, we only do it for Tessa Corsa and those kind of events. Um, the, the Porsche is if, you know, depends if we're going to drive, you know, how we're going to drive or if I'm going to do a drag strip day, I'll always take the Taycan for drag strips. Um, but typically it's going to be either the Lightning or the Cybertruck at this point. And it really comes down to, do we want to go and have dinner or do we want to go and have dinner and 20 minutes of conversations? So it, it kind of comes down to that. My wife will tell me, you know, I really don't want to take the, the cyber truck today because I really just want to go eat and yeah. come home, <laughs> you know? So I think my favorite picture that I've ever seen, uh, and I showed it to my wife because it was so relatable and so hilarious and just escalated with the, the cyber truck is uh, you guys trying to go to Starbucks and uh, she's got the, you know, the, the, um, the breakfast club don't you forget about me song going is there's a picture of your starbucks drink is right there ready to go and there's you in the background off in the distance sure enough with your cyber truck and having conversations because you can't even get away from the truck i mean how often yeah. is that you know we saw together when we were out having lunch and you know the kids are jumping out of their car at the drive through and the parents are coming around and like is, is that just your life now every time in the truck have you ever successfully gone from point a to point b and back home again and not had that happen no so what happens is well first of all i'm waiting for the first accident to happen because everywhere i drive i look left and right and there's a car sitting in my blind spot and i know he's videotaping or taking a picture that's that's just normal um but when we go somewhere two things happen one i either pull up and there's somebody kind of near the truck already and they'll start asking questions or i'll go inside somewhere and when i come out the truck is surrounded and as soon as I get there, they're like, oh, can I see inside? Can I touch it? Can I do this or that? Um, that particular day, the Starbucks, we were drinking coffee, and and uh, there was a, a Rivian pulled up right next to my truck, and a Porsche Taycan pulled up next to my truck. So I kind of got out talking to the guys, and that's kind of it's kind of fun for me to talk to other EV owners and stuff like that. So, yeah, she wasn't real happy when I spent 20 minutes away from what was supposed to be kind of a date day. And I'm over there talking to everybody around, the, around my truck. Um but, you know, I, I enjoy those conversations. I really enjoy engaging with other EV owners and, and, and non-EV owners. I love hearing what the what are the thought processes of people who don't like EVs or who want to go EVs but haven't yet, as well as those who have already made that choice to go EV and to see what made them go and, and why they're staying. So to me, that's that's always that's fun for me. That's that's real en enjoyment for me to get out there and engage with people. Which is why we started the podcast. I mean, I I'm based out of Tennessee. Uh, Jesse's based out of Tennessee as well, and uh, the uh, the culture here is different than California when it comes to EV acceptance. And I mean, pulling up to the pickup grocery store and popping my you know my lightning frunk. I mean, got all the looks and the attention. And wait, what? And you know, it's just so foreign here to bring in such a radical concept. I mean, it's not even that crazy, but it's still like for them, it was just mind blowing. Um, but the amount of conversations I've had as a, you know, an EV uh, not leader, an EV enthusiast, I'd say um, is just, uh, you know, I enjoy it too, going to places. And obviously I don't have the super polarizing vehicle. I mean, my truck looks like a F-150, but you get all the people questions that the lightning, like, why are you not on the side of the road with a dead battery and just all the stupid jokes, but all at the same time, a lot of people asking the questions. Um, but the reason we started the podcast was, Hey, like there's not enough people just having realistic conversations about the the pros and the cons of the EV, the EV space. What is it like to go to an EA station and have issues? What is it like to go to an EA station that's covered with vending machines? Like uh, Chris got to experience the other day. Um, but also, what is it, you know, what's the pros and cons? How much do you save? How much do you not save? Like, you know, the all of the its and bits and the fun and the e-torque and those things are something that the amount of people I put in my truck and they're like, well, I didn't realize an electric vehicle could do that. And it's like, yeah. And I don't even have a tie can. I have a, a lightning that goes 3.9, 0 to 60. <laughs> uh, but it's just, I mean, it's, it's an entertaining thing to be able to kind of spotlight people's ignorance on the industry especially um in an area like tennessee where you know people just don't know um and so being able to bring that bring that to light uh across this region specifically 
Uh, but then obviously going into a culture like California where EVs are a good you know, percentage sales of the EV industry, uh, it helps to kind of get good positive uh, and negative experience feedback and kind of what that looks like from Tesla to, you know, CCS drivers. And as that adapt adaptation comes over from CCS to Nax. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a different animal down here. Between the F-150 and the Cybertruck, what similarities and what big differences do you have? Because that's going to be something that I get to experience soon is coming from 45,000 miles of an F-150 into a cyber beast. Uh, I, I definitely end you there with the cyber beast. That's one thing where I, I kind of had that, that conversation myself. Do I, do I, do I want the truck now or do I want to have the truck later, but have the, the cyber beast and um, kind of, it kind of made sense for me to get the truck now because of all of our clubs and engagement levels and stuff like that to get it now and, and see, try to, I do have a second reservation. So eventually someday we'll have a cyber beast. Um, but yes. And so the lightning is, is what the lightning is. The lightning is an F-150. So it's going to do exactly what F-150 does. It's going to be your everyday work truck. It's going to be perfect for that. It's not flashy. It's not uh, the poor man's truck. It's it's a it's a, your general everyday use truck. It's huge inside. I'm a big guy. I'm six foot four, two hundred fifty pounds. I can get into that truck super easy. There's plenty of room in the back seat. There's plenty of room in the front and in the trunk and everything you everything you need that F one fifty four. The cyber cyber truck. It's a truck as well. So I mean, I can still put stuff in the bed. I can still put a little bit less stuff in the front. It's big enough for me in the front seat. However, the back seat. I'm six to four. I sat in the back. My head actually touches the glass. Mm -hmm. So six to four, six foot two, I think is the max you're going to be able to put someone in the back seat of the Cybertruck. So for that reason, think about that. It, but, I, but you know, I, why would I sit in the back seat of my own truck? I don't care. I sit in the front seat, so I'm good. Um, I, my kid's 21, so I don't have kids. I'm not running around to the baseball and football games anymore. So it's really just me and my wife. So um, I do sell exercise equipment in my daily life. That's my normal job. So I do carry sometimes thousands of pounds of, of either weight plates or bars or machines or whatever. So either truck is going to work well for that purpose. Um, this lightning, I'm sorry, the Cybertruck does have the air suspension, makes it a little bit easier to get in and out of the truck. However, the lightning has my step up. So it's like one of those things where you can, you can put a, a pros and cons board up. You're going to have probably equal on both sides. Um, Tesla's going to be a little heads up in the charging category. However, Lightning will probably be able to charge a Tesla this year. So maybe that, you know, those, those kind of equal out. It really comes down to what's the longevity of each truck going to be, right? So far, my Lightning over a year and a half has been fantastic. 25,000 miles. It's really a great truck. Uh, no real major issues with it. Um, I've had the Lightning for three weeks, or sorry, the time truck for three weeks. No, no issues with that. So, you got to cross those kind of things out. It really comes down to, do you want to be noticed right now? And, or do you want to just kind of open your frunk and maybe be noticed on your lightning? <laughs> um, you know what I mean? So I've done the same thing. You go to the grocery, you, you pop the grocery in the frunk and people walk by and go, where's your engine? You know? Um, so it, it's one of the things where it's kind of just going to be, what, what do I, what am I going to do that day? Do I, am I going to be parking somewhere where I know the truck's going to be a lot of, a lot of people surrounded and maybe I don't want that attention. Maybe I'm in a bad area. Um, is it, do I want to just go to the store and come back and leave and not have anybody talking to me about the truck that day? Um, I actually love driving the cyber truck. I think it, it drives really well. The steer by wire is fun. The, you know, it has the same uh, level of uh, pickup as the lightning. So, but still, it's kind of fun to drive those big old 35 inch tires on this hyper truck as well. Those things um, are beefy, beefy, beefy big man. tires. Yeah. Yeah. But again, so from from the utility standpoint, for me, it's pretty much the same. Um, and and again, I got outlets in the back of the cyber truck if I when I need to. So it's it's a very similar experience. Like I said, it's just going to be: do you want to be engaging with people today or not? I think well, I think that the stigma eventually drops. I mean, once you get enough cyber trucks and enough people have gotten into them and all the enthusiasts are able to get their trucks, then in a year's time that will die down. But the newness and the excitement of that, um, it happened with the lightning too. I mean, I got my truck probably a month after the big Fed like the release, like they announced it, started shipping mid-May. It was uh mid-July when I got ours. And um, it was, you know, we were getting a lot of attention then fade six and 
you were seeing, and it's already happened with Cybertruck, you were seeing people sell Lightnings for $150,000, and you're already seeing a couple Cybertrucks posted online for two fifty. dollars I yep. saw one that was marked for two fifty, dollars and it actually was marked sold, and I was like, wow. But, I mean, that's that's where the Cybertruck market is. Now, obviously, Cybertruck's a lot more polarizing than the Lightning was, but that's something I think over time, six to nine months, you'll probably see that fade once they get a few, you know, dozen thousand out there and, uh, you know, get get some of the initial hype over with. Interesting yeah, I, to see what uh, what that looks like in Tennessee, because California does have that car culture. It does have Teslas everywhere. It does, you know, have a dozen or so kind of driving around on a regular basis and in, in, you know, around the state. You know, when Jesse gets his Cybertruck and starts going through the haulers that we've talked about i am uh, i'm definitely interested to see because we know that that part of the country is is different in, in the way it views these vehicles and so that's going to be a a real interesting thing is does that does that help bring attention and bring understanding bring curiosity um and or, or like or does it you know cause conflict and problems but I mean, I, I don't know. I find that in, in online, it's real easy to to throw shade and flame and all this crazy stuff. And then I would guess, Will, like in the public, you don't you're not getting that. You're getting true. Again, California being a different place. But I would guess people like you were saying, people driving by, taking pictures, every stop you're making, they're curious. Have you had any of that kind of negative pushback or any of that? uh kind of like mockery or or anything like that and what's that been like yeah i, I was i was saying about one percent um I, I i do like we had it's kind of funny uh, we were we just wrapped the truck we went to the beach to film it so we're filming it and this this older gentleman walks but walks right up to the truck and i say oh excuse me can um we're filming can you uh, take your picture and put it back he goes well this is trash and i said well do you often take pictures of trash <laughs> and we kind of had a little conversation about it. And he was all talking, you know, he brought up, oh, well, they don't charge in the cold. Just look at Chicago and they don't do this and that. And I had a, you know, a little, little conversation while well, I've been doing this for eight years, all EV, over 200,000 miles, all EV. I've driven from here to the Hoover Dam, to San Francisco, to San Diego. I, I seem to do, be just, just fine. And, you know, it's, so you do get that a little bit. Um, but still that's, that's, that's the, that's the engagement I actually want. Cause I want to be able to talk to that person and maybe explain, yeah. Hey, you actually can do this. So maybe some of these, um, misconceptions you have are actually wrong, but you know, everyone's going to have their opinion and that's fine. And that's, that's kind of what it's about. It's like, Hey, we're in America, baby. You can like it or not. You can buy it or not. I don't really care. Just, you know, why don't you hear the story first? Yeah. So, yeah Experience you do it. Hear, you do hear some negatives. And I, th I think, I think that. I've spoken to a lot of people who don't know any better and I've been able to address a lot of concerns. And yet I still stand behind the fact that I, I think it's okay that EVs aren't necessarily designed for every single person's lifestyle. If I'm a truck driver and I live in Chicago and I'm haul, well, not a truck driver. If I'm, if I drive a truck and I haul stuff uh, distances and I live in Chicago, I'm going to face a lot more uphill than living in a moderate climate and doing residential driving. So EVs may not be my space today. And that's fully, I mean, as of right now, you might go for a hybrid truck or you may stay with your diesel truck because for hauling purposes, we're not there yet when it comes to that space. Um, however, it's something that I think that in the neutrality of the space, there needs to be a, a mutual respect of, hey, like for my life and for me, myself, it made perfect sense for me when I bought my lightning and it did nothing but save me money. And I got the truck that I wanted. I've had no issues to complain of outside of just standard uh, random maintenance issues that come up with any vehicle. Um, and I've been able to save all the fuel and had a really fun high torque truck that everybody I take in is like, Whoa. And it's like, you know, that's just, everybody has a different use case. And so I, I think that, having a common knowledge in the space that, Hey, it's not for everyone maybe, but for the average, the average American, I'd say, uh, if, if it's within the budget and you're, you're acquiring a vehicle that there's not as many negatives as one would think. Um, well, it's all yeah. about education too. You're yeah. right. So letting people know what your true experience has been with a vehicle is, is kind of the key to this. So when I look at, it, I've also, I'm at 40,000 miles. I had my truck the same time Josh did. 
Um, very, very small problems for my truck. It's the same light bar. I think everybody has had the light bar issue. And that's the only problem that I've had on my truck. A couple lights that came on for just a very few seconds and went back off. They fixed it through an upgrade. Everybody's going to know it's a different bird. Uh, but at the same time, it's good for us because it's going to be utilized to promote our charging stations. And our charging stations are all going to have a CCS and a NACS built in. And at the same time, they're going to be upwards of 300 kVW uh, charging. We hope to have a 400 kVW charge with some of them. So, you know, we'll work with different manufacturers that way. So where not only would an F-150 charge at our site with a native uh, uh, system, but also Tesla as well. That way we open it up for everybody because that's going to be the big thing to get everybody over this hump is having good access and egress to charging to where they don't have to worry that they can't get charged in the distance that they're going. So I think that's, and have it cheap. You know, the, the cost you have out there just blows our mind away when, when we start hearing, you know, 60 cents per KWH or 65 cents per KWH, you know, that is so much higher than what we're used to here. Maybe today. not in California, but for here it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the you were talking earlier about the, the EA, station out here in san francisco and it was uh it was it was pretty awesome it was all indoors and especially for san francisco that's really important uh but it is 56 cents per kilowatt hour and now it, it is the same price as any of the their other stations like if you took the ea app and you can go on there and look at all the stations in the bay area they're all 56 cents if you get out there really far you know maybe an hour and a half out in the suburbs you might get like 46 cents but it's uh yeah it's pretty pretty much the standard rate and that is what it is in anywhere from 40 to 60 cents is what you see. The, um, the one exception that I, that I had was at charge point at the corporate headquarters, their charger that I tested the, the A to Z, uh, NACS to CCS adapter on was 25 cents. That's about the best deal you're ever going to find. And that's because it's literally at the charge point corporate office where they are subsidizing the cost of that anywhere else you go. Um, whether it's Tesla, EA, EVgo, it's going to fall on that 40 to 60 cent range and even vary by time of day. And I think Tesla's starting to have, um, what, what are they called? Will, do you, do you know those new, there's like a Tesla thing where it'll, it's extra if there's a congestion rate or are you familiar oh, yeah, with that? charges or the congestion, congestion rate? Yeah. Con congestion rate. Yeah. I know there's I, some places have talked about idle charges, but yeah, I think, um, there with a congestion rate, or I think it'll stop you at eighty percent, or something to that effect. And so there's a lot of different strategies as they as they try to figure out how they're going to do that. Um, I mean, what being out there in Tennessee, Jesse, how do you think it's going to be received when you know you've got? It's a different calculus, right? Because the gas prices out here are high, and the electrical is high. Um, if you're not charging, if you're charging at home, it's a clear savings, right? But if honestly, like when I did my trip down to Sea Will, it cost me almost the same with public charging costs as it would have if I did gas. Yeah. Um, and see, it, I was going from here to DC in my truck and working at a data center there I was building a data center for a, a large conglomerate that you've all heard of. And I was stopping twice on my way up to DC. This was every week for like the past uh, three, four months. And it was actually more expensive per mile for me to do that versus say an F-150 that has a, uh, the the four cylinder turbo and that's, engine, and that's with you know, gas prices more. being back to two dollars a gallon compared to what they were at five. Because when the gas prices were at an all time high, you know, gas was five fifty a gallon here, um, and so at that at that price, it was three times more expensive, you know, <laughs> to drive that. But when gas is under two, like we're seeing in some of these locations, it is going back to being pretty rivalry when it with electric prices on, especially on the roads with the power companies charging a premium because of lack of electricity availability. Yeah, that's and, and I'll tell you for hours, 22 cents per KWH before we even can start getting a profit or even covering our cost. Yeah, and I'll, yeah. I'll tell you, there was um, there was a story a, a while back now. You'd have to probably Google search. It. it was done by the Washington Post, and they did a really, really good job of going through and evaluating and doing like an independent cost analysis of the cost in the pacific northwest it was always better off in an ev in california it was better if you were charging at home but if you were on the road it was you know maybe 20 dollars cheaper um, and then they did a, a midwest study and there were a lot of times where the hybrid 
um, or, or the, or the, you know, even with gas prices, how they are now, it was a break even, or even in, in the benefit of the gas vehicle. Um, and so it really is dependent on, on the areas. And it's, um, it's a really interesting article. You have to go back uh, again. It's the Washington post. It'll, it's like, is it cheaper to refuel your EV battery or gas tank? And they did, you know, they did all the math and they have graphs and all this really great stuff. So it's definitely, um, and, and then supply and demand is going to be interesting because, you know, California rates, I'm sure you're seeing it will have definitely gone up over the past two or three years. As EVs get more prominent, the supply gets shorter. And uh, again, if it wasn't for my solar, man, I mean, solar pretty much makes it almost free. I mean, um, and, and I don't know if you have solar will or how you're, how you're doing it out there and, and your, your cost hit, but I know mine, my rates have gone up, you know, what, what are you seeing? Yeah. So the California has, has a fun, has a fun, uh, program for us they push you to do something they incentivize you to do something and then once you do it then they bring the hammer down and, and, and smash it for the rest of for the rest of the time so yeah our i do have solar thankfully but like when i got my solar i was in a program where basically i was getting a hundred dollars back a year i paid zero dollars for any of my electricity for the first three years i, mean, I was charging my cars on it my house on it, i had air conditioning running i was still getting a hundred dollar check back every year now I'm paying about 1300 bucks a year, which is still way cheaper than if I were to use gas. But you know, that's a 1300% increase or whatever that is. Um, and it's the PUC out here, they just, they're, they're, they're raising rates again. So yeah, it's going to continue to get more expensive out here. Unfortunately, you know, they like to shut down all the power plants out here. And then that's what, what happens, right? Supply and demand, your demand price goes up because there's no supply. So yeah, we're seeing, we're seeing those rates go way up here. Um, it's still, I think, overall cheaper. Like Chris said, if you charge at home, it's still overall cheaper, which is what probably 95% of my charging is. Um, I'm an outside sales. I drive about 25,000 miles a year. And even with that, I'm only charging outside my home maybe three or four times a month at the most. Uh, obviously, I want trips. I'm charging outside the house. But I can still make those ranges with, with the vehicles I have uh, fit within my schedule for the day. So I'm not paying those super high prices, but you know, gas out here is still four fifty to five dollars a gallon, depending on where you're going. So we're yeah, not think... we're nowhere near what the Midwest and these in the uh, I don't know about these coast, but the Midwest is getting in two dollars a gallon. I'm loving that number. Where's that at? Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> ship, I, ship a tanker. I, yeah, and I I think that the the reality is when it comes to the the generalized American use, most people don't take road trips every day. Um, if right, you look right. at ninety ninety seven. I'd say not, I, I'm just guessing 97% of Americans don't travel more than a hundred miles a day, but one day or like on, on the one trip that they, they travel a year. Um, and so in that regard, most people would benefit, you know, and, and have the cost savings of at home charging. Um, and even with high residential rates, it should still be, in my opinion, cheaper than the gas rates. Um, Cause at home charging has been the big win for me point blank just because especially with solar i don't have solar in my house as of yet but that's something that um you know there's huge there's huge benefits uh for me to charge at home connected to my grid because the residential rate is literally 20 percent of the cost of gas um, the public infrastructure equals out about um and i travel i would say i travel more on the roads than the average person does uh, for work, but that's something that, um, you know, in general, I'm still saving net month over month because of that. Um, but that's, you know, I think that that's something that we have to find out ways to um, continue to look at rather than the, the EV, you know, per kilowatt price going up uh, by these providers to try to make a profit. Uh, there needs to be some sort of consideration for price because that that is something that is going to affect uh, adoption is if you know if gas prices let's say all vehicles were EV and gas prices came out and gas prices were eighteen dollars a gallon nobody would want to go to a gas powered vehicle because it's so expensive even if it did make more sense um, and that's where we have to figure out you know comparatively how to take EVs and not only make them a cost savings when you purchase them but a cost savings you know in general to drive and use them um, because I mentioned this last week I think when we had Franny on it was you know I don't think most people are going to say, oh, I'm going to do the environmental friendly thing and sign up for a worse financial situation with a more expensive vehicle and more expensive refueling doesn't make any sense. But having a situation where you can be environmentally responsible while saving money, that's going to resonate with a lot more people um, because, you know, so 
dollars in pocket speaks a lot more than uh, a lot of other things. So, I, yeah, I think big... that's that's the big that's the big downside to EV adoption is, is what the charging infrastructure looks like today. And that's why I'm I'm actually as much of an EV advocate as I am. I'm completely against mandates of having to go EV by the, by a certain date. Yeah, I personally feel I like look. I'm sorry. No, I was gonna say I, I totally agree. Like this, this is a conversation we have all the time in in public, where a lot of the resistance, a lot of what's hurting the movement, is this idea of mandates. And um, I I I think that you know the environmental things get skewed. It's um, it's they've done these studies and they and they show that even if you were talking about getting your elect, you know, hey, you're you're running electric, but it's not all solar, especially if you're charging overnight, you're getting it off a plant. You know, it's but even with that, it's still tenfold better in terms of the amount of pollution that comes from a plant, uh, the pounds of CO2 that go out um, uh, for the energy produced that goes into your truck. It's 100 times more for, for a gas vehicle. And so that, I think, is clear, but we do a really bad job of understanding it. But even if you did understand it, that's not enough. That's not enough to get people into the vehicle because what really they care about is what hits their pop pocketbook, and and the the maintenance and the the oil changes and the all of the you know the the fuel pump and the alternator and all these things that you know you can eliminate. That's where it's the value, and it's got to feel it's got to feel just like you know for for those that aren't early adopters like us that we kind of we almost enjoy the game, right? We almost enjoy the newness and. What's the, you know, how do we figure it out? And what are the ways that we can hypermile it? And what are the ways that we can get the best advantage from it and have fun with it? But for the average Joe, Jane, and Bill out there, right, in the world, they need to hop in it. It needs to feel and act and be as reliable as their gas or hybrid, or, or otherwise it just won't work. Yeah. And, and the conversation around, if we can have the conversation around, look, okay, so, and, and you know, everyone has that, has that one case use. You always get that one guy, well, I can't drive my, my tow bike trailer from Dallas to Minnesota. I'm like, okay, do you do that, really? Yeah. But what, what do you drive around day to day? If, you know, there's always the conversation of him, look, maybe you can't go all EV, but could you have one and take away your for your day-to-day -day usage, right? If we can have those kind of conversations, but then if we can get around that to those more reliability in the charging network system, Honestly, I would I personally would pay a dollar a kilowatt if if I knew the station was going to be up and running and ready for me when I needed it. Right. Yeah. So it's I, I, I'm not everyone will do that, but it's just more we go to these these charging stations and you see these lines of six to eight vehicles waiting to charge. That's that's where your adoption dies. That's where I'm excited for this this Tesla network opening up because exactly to your point when I, you know when I did the drive and I was kind of testing the EA network and how far I could get on my truck I, I'm willing to do that and I got down to like two percent and you know was really pushing the limits of the truck and um, I'm willing to do that when it's just me and, and I had you know when is at Santa Clarita at the Walmart EA station there problems I mean there was there was. The first one thought I was Javier and an EV6, and the second one had a communication error, and then I finally plugged into the third, and it worked, but it was slightly derated. You know, then I went into the Walmart, and some poor guy is there in a Polestar, Polestar with his uh, with the, with the connector locked to his vehicle. I mean, and there was lines and weights and and all that, and I would have gladly paid a a dollar to have been at a, a Tesla charger and had none of that, and particularly. You know, part of uh, part of the the fun of going down there was testing what I could do so that I could get my my family on a trip to Disneyland later this year. And the first thing I thought was I would never risk any of what I just risked with my wife and my kids in the car. I would uh, I would totally pay more to go to a Tesla situation that I knew 100 percent I could rely on and not have to worry about it. And, and like, so that is it seems like California needs power of America. That's, that's strange. Right. Get, get you guys out here. Uh, and and to your point earlier, too, I believe in the right tool for the right job. I had um, a guy was coming out just to do my annual check on my solar system that I have. And that he comes out from a com company that's a little bit in the Central Valley of California. And he's got a Silverado 2500. And he was really fascinated by the lightning. He loved it. I, get, I let him drive it. And he was just blown away with with how it rode, how smooth it was, um, the, the power of it. And it was he was blown away. And then he's like, you know, but I couldn't, I couldn't own this because his drive and his time is everything to him. And I'm sure, Will, you can relate to this. If you're going, 
you know, as part of your work to multiple stops and driving around and then someone calls you, you got to do another stop. You just don't have time to stop for 30 minutes and, and charge it up. And you're already commuting a long distance. And in this guy's case, he's doing solar all the time. So he's got big ladders on top of his truck and a lot of electrical equipment in the back. And the, all of that, he needed the eight foot bed of the 2500. He needed the big, long ladder rack to go the full length of that truck. And then I just told him, I said, look, man, it's the right tool for the right job for what you do. You need this 2500. You need it to be this big, this large. And maybe because maybe a solution like the Ram Master would be a good fit for him when, once that drops. <laughs> the Ram Charger, right? Maybe that's yeah. the better solution. Not, not the Ram Master, the Ram Charger, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, right? But but look, me, I, I'm not getting up on my roof. Uh, I am trying to change my light bulb, right? So yeah. I need a step ladder. I own a step ladder. It, it's not... It's not the right tool for me to go out and get a 2500 or a diesel. That's not my use case. And it's not right for him to go and bring a step ladder when he's trying to get up on the roof. And so when you mandate things, it causes resentment. It causes problems. It's, um, it, it's I think, a, it's the wrong way to go, and it stops the conversation. I want to initiate the conversation. And that's that's what's so great, Will, about the the wraps that you do and the things that you drive, whether it's the Porsche or the Lightning, or now the Cybertruck, is it initiates the conversation. And that's the way, better, better way to go. Let me let you drive it. Let me let you get into it. Let me let you feel this. Let me show you it's a better product in most use cases. And then there's those that it's not. And I respect that. And, and there's that mandate thing, I think, is a real obstacle for us. Well, in, in my opinion, Americans don't like to be told what to do. So yeah. <laughs> let them, let them start from the very beginning. Own. Start from the yeah. very beginning. <laughs> Don't tell let, Americans let them, what let to them, do. Yeah. Give them a viable solution. Let them find it and they will adopt. Don't shove something in their face. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's the whole purpose. And I, I mean, one of the reasons that I love having the community that we have is just highlighting the pros and cons and the use case, because I think a lot of people are hesitant towards adoption based just on ignorance and being able to overcome some of those traditional objections just by expressing real life conversations of what drivers are and what they experience. Um, I've mentioned this twice already, but Ben Westby, you know, lives off grid in Colorado and he literally has his truck powering his house because he doesn't, he's not even connected to the grid. And that's an extreme example, but that's a perfect fit for somebody like that in his life where that's nothing. I mean, outside of that, he's having to go to town every day and get gas for his generator. Um, but, you know, for the average person like me and you that are going to be able to drive around town and have the benefits, there's no cons. Lower maintenance costs, great longevity. Um, you know, basically it's, it's, it's a slam dunk, but if you have a good use case and a good argument for somebody that's reasonable uh, to actually understand those things, I don't think that there's any stigma behind uh, having that uh, conversation as far as purchasing one, if it made sense, but affordability and charging infrastructure has been our repeated themes on this podcast over and over and over again, that's limiting adoption. And I think that if we can get those two things worked on, which we're working on, um, that's something that I think that we will see just the natural adoption pick up and it may not ever be you know more than 50 percent, but 30 40 percent evs is going to make a big difference on the roads than um than we're, where we sit currently so uh, if, I, I talk to dealers all the time and i, I I'm, it's it's i'm in sales so i'm going to sell the least the, the least amount of friction i'm gonna, that's the sale i'm going to go after right so if you walk into my dealership and let's say you're looking for an, an suv and i've got my ev suv and my regular suv Whatever is going to be the easiest sale for me to sell you is I'm going to push that product. And the EV at the, at the time is going to be a bigger bigger conversation and educational moment. So I'm probably not going to shove that in your face. I'm going to kind of push the easier product. We need to make it to where maybe there's some, some incentives to sell that EV over the gas product. Make that sale and, hey, well, I'm going to make a little more money this way. Let me see if I can give you some more education. But right now, we're totally not seeing that. We're seeing that you walk in. And I'm going to push you to that that real super easy product to sell you, which is the gas EV. Well, now, I think did a you good say point. You race a Model Three. I'm sorry. Did you do you race a Model Three? Is that what I heard early on in this? I do. Yes. What what series do you race that in? Uh, Tesla Corsa. We have Tesla Corsa here. It's a it's a um, event run by um, Unplug Performance, and 
they basically, we go out to Button Willow for the most part, racetrack, as we've also been out to uh, Laguna Seca. But uh, they team up with a company called um, Speed Ventures, and you'll go out and you'll have one one session will be all gas cars, the next session all Teslas, the next session all gas cars and all Teslas. And they have beginning sessions as well as advanced sessions. So it doesn't matter if you're if you're an uh, I'm sorry, a experienced race driver or your first time, um, you can kind of do that stuff. So yeah, so I've had a lot of fun with the racing the Model Three around the track. Um, but I've also raced a Model S and a Model X around the track, so I had fun doing that too. Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. But we completely stripped out the suspension and the braking system and and put in all racing components to it. I think a lot of people don't know that that's even a thing. I mean, there's uh, there's definitely a, an aftermarket, for, especially for the three. The three has quite a bit that you can do with the suspension, the brakes, and different aero kits and and things like that. And that's uh, I think it's good for people to hear that too. The people that are the racing enthusiasts and the ones that like to you know tear through the canyons and get on those racetracks and do things it's yeah jesse jesse if the, i think the challenge yeah for, is like for people like jesse and and for you will and josh you're you're six six two six three i'm i'm six 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 so six I'm, you're I'm, all I'm, okay God. yeah I, i'm i'm a big yeah. boy and, and the lightning fits perfectly for me <laughs> yeah that's that's the hard thing about about those you right? will not the, catch the me in the cars. second row of a cyber truck that is for sure yeah, if anybody's old enough to remember the Police Academy movies where the, he tears the front seat out and sits in the back seat of that little Honda, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was always what I imagine when I think of like you know Joe that up was, in the, the that, northeast. That was me and, and my first Ford Focus. I drove. It was my first car I bought for myself. Was a Ford Focus, and I was in the back seat driving. So, yeah. so wow. I'm trying to imagine Will sitting in that Model Three. You know, yeah. yeah. I, I, There's I would, a lot of room in the three, though. I I, actually, I have no problem sitting in that car. It, it's getting in and out. It's a problem, but. Yeah. yeah, once I'm in it, that's perfect. Yeah. So let's let's talk as as we wrap up. Let's let's talk some some of the little details, right? Like ha having um not spent anywhere near the amount of time you've spent in the cyber truck, um, but been in a couple of them now. I think my like quick observations are that I I think the lightning is uh despite the air suspension, I find it to be a smoother ride. I find it to be a quieter ride. Maybe that's because of those big beefy tires um kind of contribute to that. Um, I, I find that that steering is just outrageously amazing in, in the way that that steer by wire, I'm hoping that's the future of the world. I mean, I can't do a U-turn in the lightning as I'm sure all you guys know, unless it's a three lane wide road. Uh, if it's a two lane, I, the U-turn doesn't work. You got to do a three point turn or get way out into the intersection to make it work. Um, the sound system I believe is amazing in the Tesla, um, I think it's kind of underwhelming in the lightning. I mean, just the the frunk I think is is better in the lightning. I think the tonneau is better in the in the cyber truck, but then it blocks your view. It's like you were saying, there's all this give and take, right? So, give me your your top, like where where is the lightning still the better experience for you? Where is the cyber truck the better experience for you? If you're put a gun to my head and say you have to drive off of one of these trucks, you know, the lightning is probably the the truck to drive off in. It it's still to me overall probably the the best driving experience but it does lack in some in, in in some cases so like i said that cyber truck with the turning radius is amazing the rear wheel steering i can make u-turns it makes it much more happy for me right um again i think there's plenty of room in the front seat for me so it doesn't bother me but again that back seat is lacking um in size uh you know, I, I've had three weeks in the truck, so four weeks in the truck, I think, this week. So get, give me a little bit more time. I might have a different different opinion. Um, right now, I'm really just enjoying the engaging part of the truck. Um, but I think uh, Josh said earlier, what's going to happen, or just said earlier, what's going to happen six months from now, right? When, there, when there's, you, you see 20, 30 cyber trucks a day on the street, is that really, that engagement level going to be there? And it's just going to be another odd truck on the road. Um I don't know. I mean, everyone still likes likes to look at Rivian, even though there's hundreds of Rivians a day you see out here. So true. Um, yep. I, I think I think overall, honestly, if I were if if I were just a regular consumer, if I wasn't who I was, I think I'd pick the Lightning over the Cybertruck, uh, just because from an overall 100 score, I think the the Lightning probably does does more, especially when you connect it to the Tesla charging network. Yeah. Uh, I think the Cybertruck has a huge advantage with the charging network until that until that happens yeah and that should be coming any 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 day now here they're saying the spring so that's right around the corner and then you know we're gonna 
that's going to make your events a heck of a lot more interesting too when you're doing your zero runs and i think it's going to yeah. pull the community even even better together where it starts to intermingle those different manufacturers i i think all that stuff is is going to be a blast and i think it goes right to the point of where you said hey i wanted to take this vehicle now and not wait for the cyber beast because it is about engagement and that's the whole point of what you do whether it's with f the pump or socal evs or tesla socal it's it's all about that engagement, and I think that's that's why Josh and Jesse started the podcast was all about engagement out in an area that needs a lot more of it. And I think that's the fun of of what all of us are trying to do. That's why I go to these different events. Um, I love showing up to these Tesla events in my Lightning, and I love that they've allowed me to. I love that they've been so gracious about it, and I love that engagement of letting people see and get in and experience something that is so easy to make fun of online, to make fun of Ford or make fun of the OEMs that are trying and are still a decade behind Tesla in so many ways. I think, I think it's from the experience, it's not as far as behind as people think it is. If Once they get in it and experience it and feel it and drive it, um, there's certainly some gaps there to be sure, but it's not as wide as people think. And from a value perspective, I still think the Lightning is the best value of all of them. Um, when you think about whether it's the Hummer, the Rivian, the Cybertruck, the Lightning is still the best value. There's reasons that it's a value and that it's not as expensive as the others. But in terms of what a lot of people just need every single day, uh, the basics of of what an EV can deliver for the average driver, I think it does that and it does it at a great value. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, I got to wrap up here. I got to um, head off to another appointment, but uh Great having this conversation. I would love to have you back on, Will, at some point uh, to continue this conversation. Sure. Anytime. Awesome. Well, been another episode. Tune in next week for more exciting information.